Um, hi, this is Subia Judd. I'm the board president of Rural Roots. Welcome all you listeners to the Sustainable Ag Speaker Series. Um, today, um, January 18th, 2023, we are welcoming as our speaker, Deb Pearson, WSU farm manager and manager of WSU's Orchard. Um, Deb has been working at the Orchard since 1983. She grew up on a dairy farm in Minnesota. Got her BS in environmental science with a concentration in agriculture at WSU in 1981. Um, she became a plant technician in 83, was promoted to ag resource technician in 1987. In 1980, was promoted to farm manager. In 2003, she got her MS in etymology. Her latest big project has been designing and supervising the relocation of the WSU orchard because of the airport runway realignment. And she is here to tell us all about um, that process of moving the orchard from choosing the fruit to choosing the site to, um, to figuring out the logistics of planting. So welcome, Deb. Welcome. All right, thanks for that introduction. So I'll get right started on it. Um, we have 41 slides and 45 minutes. So uh, I was told I could go over, but I don't wanna go over too much. It's a huge topic. Um, as you can see on your screen, planting a new orchard. Um, so this could be orchard or berries. Um, I'm gonna just leave it more general, but we'll be touching on many aspects of establishing a new perennial planting is what I called it. Um, including site selection, variety selection, layout, infrastructure, planting, and first year concern. So I will kind of blend in the tour of the new horticulture center um, inside the Spillman farm by uh, going through these topics, but using pictures that I've gotten from our new site that we're uh, working on now. So site selection, orientation, and slope. That was a really intense part of the airport runway realignment um, that we had to figure out where we were gonna move to. And then site preparation, ground cover, windbreaks, we'll go through that. Variety selection, I'm, I'm not gonna tell you what varieties to plant, but I'm gonna tell you how to decide that for yourself. Um, that is a very individual uh, thing, I believe, because Certain people have certain tastes and um, so, but you wanna have success with whatever you choose. So I'm gonna try to help you figure that out. Infrastructure selection, I'll give you a few ideas about that, um, but there's a lot on the internet with all of this stuff that you should look into yourself for your specific situation. Irrigation type, we'll touch on that. Proper planting technique, water management, first year and beyond. First year is always different than beyond. That's what I wanna emphasize. Uh, tree training, so the whip or the stick or the feathered tree. So it depends what kind of plant you purchase. Then our biggest problems for fruit trees are rodents and birds, right? The invertebrate pests. So um, this is our new building up on top of the hill inside Spillman Farm. So this is our multi, purpose facility inside here. We have uh, chairs and tables we can set up for classrooms and whatnot. We have an office, we have restrooms. This is our chemical storage building. So it's a much smaller uh, footprint than the previous one. This is our cooler with our fruit in it that is from the inside. This is a van cooler that we have because you never wanna store fruit with uh, sticks, uh, with uh, newly purchased trees because it, the ethylene from the fruit will kill the buds of the trees. So don't ever store them together. So that's why we have the separate spaces. Plus we have a little bit of concrete over here that we can stack bins and stuff like that. We also planted a little potted flower area um, because we are a horticulture department, not just fruit, but uh, landscape plants and flowers too. And then um, the bins over here, they're handy for holding fruit, but they're handy for fruit holding um, plants as well. So uh, we used everything to its most. Now behind the white cooler that you saw, there is this area that we uh, put a fence around and we built these, um, got the idea from uh, 
over at the Stefan Center, they had these uh, four inch potted pots that you can do grafts and then put them in there and let them heal in or let them grow for a year or so. Um, I've also discovered these uh, fabric pots, which are great because we had some 15 gallon pots. These are only one gallon, but we had 15 gallon ones that we ended up having to keep the trees in for a year. Hmm. And we didn't really get any circling of the roots. So the fabric pots are great. But these are great structures for those four inch tall root cone kind of things. If you need to keep uh, that kind of thing for any time, I put it over here on the north side of the building. So it would be kind of in the shade. And we get the most cold wind from the northeast um, so that uh, in the winter time, it's kind of protected from the winter winds. So it's always good to think about what side of a building or where you're going to put things that you want for the future. This is a smaller building that we got. Um, they built us as, uh, there's no uh, water in it, but there's electricity and heat. So that's nice. And that's our little sprayer that we have for behind the our ATV that we can use for weed spraying in our tree and our new orchard with the smaller trees. So that's pretty handy. So considerations for site selection, ask yourself many, many questions. Think it through very thoroughly. You're investing a lot of money, especially if you plant a large area. If you only have a couple of trees, you still wanna think about it a little bit, but maybe not quite as uh, detailed. Proximity to nearby structures. So keep in mind, what is the full size of your tree going to be? Because I see so many times that people have planted trees in their yards and by golly, the tree needs a lot more space than what they allowed it. Um, your, your tree, if you're gonna let it be a full size tree, it can be, you know, 12 feet wide. You know, you don't wanna put it three feet away from your house. So just think about that. If you do want to keep it three feet wide, that's fine. Um, but think about that. Neighboring land use. So I put this in pesticide sprays and neighbors. So that goes both directions though, right? Like if you have your orchard next to a wheat field and they're spraying broadleaf pesticide, uh, herbicides, they could kill your trees, right? So you wanna maybe put up like some kind of tree uh, guard area or something if you have neighbors that are spraying, or if you have neighbors that are really um, hesitant about having chemicals used around them, you might spray on them. So it goes both ways. So you just have to be, think about your neighboring land use and what you are going to be doing and what they are going to be doing. See if it, it works in both directions. Um, if you're up on the top of a hill, it's a good view, but there's a lot of wind. If you're down in the valley, all the cold air settles down there. So really the best location for orchard trees is on a slope so that um, you can have the air drainage. So the cold air can drain down into those low spots. Um, also, if you're in a valley, um, you do have good water, maybe a high water table, um, but the water table may be too shallow for those tree roots. A lot of trees don't like wet roots. Um, poplar trees do, but uh, not necessarily fruit trees. So think about that. Prevailing wind direction. If you can protect your trees from the cold winter winds, that might be a good thing. Drainage is important. Um, with our polluted soils, especially, you never want to be in a sunken hole with your fruit trees. Um, you want to be able to have that water drain past it. Even though you do want to irrigate, um, you know, you don't want all your irrigation water to flow off, but you don't want your trees to be in standing water. Degree of slope. How will you farm and maintain the area? Are you going to mow the grass? Um, what equipment will you use? If you have a really steep slope, your tractor is not gonna be able to be on that slope. If you're walking behind a lawnmower, um, then it doesn't matter as much, but, or a weed eater. Um, you need to probably keep the vegetation short around the trees if you don't want to 
help the rodents have habitat for right up next to the trees. Um, orientation of the slope. So I put down here, if you want to think about it, um, you could have a north facing slope. Um, then you may not have to water as much or as frequently because that would stay more moist for a longer time. You still would have to water. I'm not saying you don't have to water, but you would also have a later bloom time. So it would be more shaded, it would be colder. And the south facing slope is kind of what they recommend for orchards. Um, and then orientation of the rows. If you're planting more than just a tree or two, uh, if you have the south facing slope and you have the rows running north south, then the rising in the east and setting in the west, you'll get the whole coverage of the sun over the top of those rows. So um, that's good to keep in mind. Uh, cold airflow, whoops. Uh, you want that cold air to be able to drain downhill. Um, cold air flows just like water. So that's why I put that on that slide. I, you never really think about it, but it, it flows like water. So if you picture water flowing off of your hillside, um, that is what your air drainage will probably be like. You don't want to have a building blocking your drainage so that all that cold air backs up onto your trees. So thinking about the airflow for sure. We will have time for questions at the end. If you really, really have a question, you can ask, but um, this is being recorded. So it uh, might be better to wait for questions till the end. Um, and I'll try to be as clear as I can, but site selection. So the top of the hill is often the windiest part. Also, the soils are often most worn out on the top of the hill. Worn out being they've washed away, the soil has blown away over the years. So when we looked, this is our site um, at Spillman Farm. This is a couple of the, this is the sheath house, if uh, you know what that is. Um, but up here on top of the hill is where we built our buildings. So it's kind of a flat spot. You wanna build buildings on a flat area so you don't have to move a lot of soil. And then our orchard is planted all the way down here. So we planted up here toward the top first, closest to the building. But then you can see these are wider. So this is kind of our flattest area, but it is still sloped both in this direction and this direction and very much down in that direction. So the, water, the air does flow off of this, but mostly it's this direction toward the west and southwest that our airflow will go. So you can kind of see uh, the building is over here up on top of the hill um, farther, but we're looking down. So the airflow would be down through the trees, through underneath the trees. So we can have trellises and the airflow can flow between the trees because um, we will have a foot or two, two or three feet under the trees that the airflow can still pass under. So the airflow can go through those trees. So it's not like our rows are blocking the airflow is what I'm saying. I uh, talked to uh, Shore Frost down in California and they do assessments of sites uh, for airflow. And they assured me that I could even plant pine trees along the bottom uh, of our uh, fence line because the wind is so bad here. Uh, we could plant wind breaks mid slope and all the way at the bottom as long as we keep the vegetation the boughs uh, pruned up he said at least two feet but if i have pine trees out there i'm probably in the long term gonna keep them pruned up four feet you know just to make sure i get that airflow so i um, always thinking about airflow for your orchard for site preparation the pros and cons of choices uh, so depth and type of soil in the Palouse, we have very, uh, it seems like it's very similar soil, but actually look at all these different types. So depending upon the slope of the land and um, 
whether it's facing one direction or another, it can have a different soil type. So the USDA Natural Resources Conservation Service has these soil maps for each of the counties. And you can look at that and see what they say about the soil that you have. For the drainage, I've been emphasizing the air. Um, but like I said, the water is important too. You don't wanna be down in the bottom with your roots in the water. Soil pH, most crops are best near neutral pH of seven. Um, if like here, the farm had been uh, farmed with annual crops for a long time and a lot of um, ammonium uh, fertilizer had been put on um, and nitrogen fertilizer, um, so the pH had actually gotten a little more acidic than neutral, um, but it, it can go the other way too. Like if you put on too much ammonium, um, then it would make it more alkaline. And a lot of crops don't like, if you get off on either end of the pH spectrum, your elements, your micronutrients get tied up in the soil. They don't release to the plants. So, I would really highly recommend getting a soil test so that you know what you're dealing with. So um, getting that soil pH just right is good. We did plant a couple rows of blueberries and we did put a little bit of sulfur amendment on the soil, just on the surface um, before we planted the blueberries um, so that we could make it a little more acidic because they like a little more acidic. Um, but that's really the only thing we did for those blueberries. The ground cover type you can decide on. We went with grass. Um, a lot of people like to do broad leaves mixed in, uh, maybe alfalfa or um, clover, but then you have a lot more rodent issues because they love those plants. Anything that's nitrogen fixing definitely has a lot more uh, protein, uh, you know, the nitrogen in that can help build proteins in the animal. So animals crave that. So they would eat uh, the broad leaves that have the uh, nitrogen fixing capabilities. Uh, they like those a lot. Um, the meadow voles and the deer mice really love it. Um, insect issues also, unfortunately around the state, um, Phytoplasmosis and little cherry disease have moved in and growers are having to take out entire cherry orchards because this is transmitted with piercing sucking insects, mostly leaf hoppers. And so if you have broadleaf plants, the leaf hoppers really like those and they can thrive on the broadleaf plants. So we're actually trying to be really careful um, with what we're doing here, we want to keep our cherry orchard healthy. So I was going to plant a lot of broadleaf plants for flowering um, on the ends of the rows and the perimeter of the orchard and everything, but um, we're going to keep all those broadleaves away from the cherry block. If you have feet of distance away and you keep the grass mowed really closely, the leaf hoppers won't like it as well. And so hopefully, getting clean, virus certified free, virus free certified um, plants, trees in, we will be able to keep those diseases out. So habitat for overwintering beneficial, but also bad insects, right? Like you can have bad things live in them too, but a lot of the uh, parasitic wasps are, they need habitat. They need overwintering standing plants that they can stay in for the winter, um, that kind of thing. So at the old site, I really focused a lot on uh, having flowering tree, flowering plants throughout the entire uh, growing season so that the bees and the beneficial insects would have some food. Um, but now with this, insect issue of transmitting the cherry virus problems. Um, I'm backing off a little bit of that, on that, off of that, at least around the cherry orchard. Um, then windbreak trees, really important out here in the Palouse. Uh, we have them planted, but I can't wait till they get bigger. <laughs> 
So pollinator friendly plants, again, if you can put in um, fall flowering plants, um, then it helps our bees a lot more. So I probably spent too much time on that one, sorry. Prepared ground and planted grass seed to hold the soil in place. So you have to think about, um, do you wanna drive tractors on your soil? Are you just, is it in your yard and you already have lawn there? But um, you know, the annual cropping systems are tilled up every year. We wanna plant so that we have stable soil so that we can drive on our grass um, without causing ruts and things like that. So this was when we tilled and first seeded. This is on the other side of the orchard. You can see the entrance to Spillman down here. And you can see one tree row right here. That's, and then two pine tree rows um, at the top. So when you plant a windbreak, two pine rows, then a tall, we used hybrid poplar, and then a shorter deciduous, and then two shrubby deciduous. So that's what will be down this hillside someday when it grows up. So this is a really steep slope in places. So you can't really drive it. You can drive a tractor part way down there, but then it gets really steep. So um, we might be getting a walk behind a really heavy duty mower that we do some of this um, clipping with. We like to keep it short because then we don't have the rodents harvesting. We have over the edge of the, where you can see the ridge there where it drops down, there is taller grass and the rodents have completely eaten all of the trees, right? So uh, if you have tall grass, um, that's a problem. So we're gonna try to do better at that and replant those. Fruit crop and tree selection. Consider your growing zone that we're in. Um, winter hardy is a must for our area, really. Um, we don't have a problem with getting our winter chill, let's say that. <laughs> um, down south, there's certain, they're limited because they don't have as much chilling factor. So, um, but see the USDA plant zone hardiness map. I tried to um, get it into the talk, but you can just go online and find that pretty easily. And, um, we're in zone six generally, I think, on that one. January thaw issues can be a problem. For the stone fruits, they come out of um, dormancy pretty easily. So if we get this January thaw or February thaw and then it crashes to cold again, um, it can fool your stone fruits. The apples generally, once they go into dormancy, they're dormant. They don't get fooled and come back out. So um, but sometimes we can have January thaw issues and we have more winter injury on some of our crops. Early season frost problems, that's when we're into bloom season. And um, it's a little scary when it blooms in March because we're probably gonna get cold again. So I prefer, I really like it when we have bloom in April. I feel a lot safer by then. But remember one year we had snow in June, you know, I mean, it can do anything it wants to do, I guess, you know? So just winter hardy is really important. Um, and a realistic um, medium to short growing season. So we can't really ripen Fuji's, really long season Fuji's, or Granny Smith, really long season grannies. Um, they tell me uh, we're too long season for, or we're too short of a season for pink ladies to really do well here. You know, so some of those really long season apples, don't try it, you know, um, or just try one and see what happens. But um, the really short season ones would be fine. Lodi and yellow transparent, those, those ripen for us in August. Um, most of the rest of the apples ripen in, like galas are, Macintosh are toward the end of um, September, and then gala is the beginning of October. And that may sound late to some of you. In Wenatchee, they're usually three weeks ahead of us for harvest times. You know, so even between Wenatchee and here, it's quite different. So pay attention to what your um, growing seasons are. Your variety of pollination compatibility also. Some of the trees are self-fertile. Some need a partner to cross-pollinate with. 
John Gold actually is a uh, pollen sterile. It's a triploid, so it cannot help pollinate anything else. So little tidbits of information like that about your plants. So um, in the handouts that I sent to Susan, I do have, it's a, a maturity chart from, um, I know you can't see that from, but it's in the handouts from uh, CNO Nursery. And I really like that because it shows the maturity of all different kinds of fruit across that calendar. And so you can get a feel for when things will ripen. Um, there is also another one that is from Vanwell Nursery. And that is an apple ripening chart. For each of the type of fruit that they have, they have this ripening chart. So they have cherries they sell, they have apples, they have peaches, you know, so you can look up um, online and find a lot of really good information from some of the nurseries that are selling to you. Pollination timing overlap. Some of them have charts that show the pollination timing um, so that you can see what things will cross pollinate and if they're open at the same time. The blue soil's heavy and holds water. Roots are tolerant. Roots that are tolerant of clay soils are a must. We were advised to use Giesla 6 rootstock under our cherries so that they can do better in the Palouse soils. A lot of the cherry rootstocks like sandier soils. So think about stuff like that. Are you gonna plant palm fruit, stone fruit, kiwis, grapes, berries? Most fruit trees uh, are kind of nice because you can choose the cyan and rootstock that you're combining. Uh, you know, they may not make that combination that you want, but hopefully they do. Uh, both the rootstock and the scion need to be winter hardy. Um, if you want a freestanding tree, you would choose either a seedling rootstock, which would be your largest tree possible, or a semi-dwarfing rootstock, which is what we had at the old orchard site. So if you've seen the trees we have there, but they're able to support themselves. You don't need trellises or posts. But if you go for a fully dwarfing, the shortest trees possible, which is easier to deal with, right? Then you need physical support for those trees. Damaging winter temperatures. This came out of the WSU publications um, that I would highly, highly recommend, recommend to you. Uh, miss, it's MISC0252 and the title is Fruit Trees for the Inland Northwest. What do you know? And they do have varieties listed and it's a wonderful publication from WSU Publications. Um, I highly recommend it. It discusses a lot of what I've already uh, been talking about with you, but then you can read it over and think about it. Apples, um, it says establish trees when fully acclimated damaging winter temperatures, right? So establish trees when fully acclimated. That's when they go into dormancy successfully in the December, January. So once they're acclimated, they can withstand apples, sour cherries, American plums, minus 30. Pears and European plums can withstand minus 20. These are the trees themselves. Sweet cherries and Japanese, minus 10 to minus 15. Apricots, minus 15. Peach, minus eight to 12. Nectarines are even more sensitive. So that is the tree temperatures. So you notice this bottom line, I say fruit buds can be injured more easily. So this is during bloom time. So that's if you get a cold snap during the bloom time. We lost some of our cherry blossoms last year. The earliest variety was Chelan. We hardly had a Chelan in the orchard because blooms were opening, they were the first ones to open, and then we had a cold snap. And then the other ones opened after that. So we had more of the other varieties of cherries. So it's very tender, even within cherries, or ap apples are the most sturdy though. So um, they don't come out of dormancy. A lot of the plums don't come out, pears don't come out. From the sweet cherries on, you can worry about a little more uh, bud injury. Oh, and this is a better view of the Vanwell 
So see, they have Lodi really early. They ripen in July, they claim. But that's in Wenatchee, right? So Pullman would probably be August, right? Is when they usually, so even what they put, you have to think about where the nursery is um, because your area might be a little later than the nursery that's publishing the information. So then you would just adjust accordingly. <clears throat> Infrastructure, I know I have to keep moving forward here. Uh, what creatures live in your area and like fruit? Okay, so we have a seven foot high hog wire kind of fence around the perimeter and that keeps out the deer, the moose, the elk. Our first year that we planted our grafted apple trees, we had rabbits come in from the river valley. They totally wiped out our first planting. Okay, we didn't have tree guards on them because the grafts were so small that I was like, well, but they need sunshine. Well, from now on, everything needs tree guards until it gets bigger and older. But we also put in uh, around the entire perimeter of our fence, we used one inch diameter chicken wire that was four feet tall, and we attached that to the deer fence. Um, if you want to get at the pocket gophers that a lot of, uh, some of you, Suvia asked about that because uh, she's have diff had difficulty with them. And if you put the hardware cloth that's three feet tall, half in the ground, half above the ground, either round the perimeter of the tree, or we did a whole uh, fenced in area for a breeding area that the, uh, Cameron Peace is using on our site here. So we're trying to keep the pocket gophers out of there because he's using those fabric potted plants above the ground. And we had them devastating our pots and eating the roots um, in the pots, the fabric pots. So we got really hardcore about it. <laughs> it's hard to dig down 18 inches into the Palouse soil. I think we only got down 12 and some, but 18 is good. Tree guards, like I said, always tree guards. The meadow voles, well, the meadow voles are the ones that leave the little trails up on top. And I have some pictures at the very end, if we have time, um, of their pathways um, that they have. And they love to girdle the trees, whatever they can reach, um, and all the way around. Um, the pocket gophers will eat the roots from the bottom up then the meadow voles, and then the rabbits are taller, so they can eat as tall as they can stand. So they love to girdle those trees too. And then the deer, moose, and elk would be on the top. So you gotta protect the whole thing. Um, I did just see um, on YouTube or on one of the nursery websites, I think it was Stark Brothers, um, they built actual cages with the hog wire around the perimeter of the trees. They used one post, one steel post, and they attached it tightly, the wire to that. Then they went around the tree and they had little, uh, the ends of the wires that they could wrap around to make it like a gate that you could open up and get in there and work on the tree. So that's the frustration if you have cages around your trees, but you gotta protect from the creatures in the area. The trellis structure, if you build a trellis, you can have tree support, you can have irrigation system support, bird netting, insect netting, shade cloth. Oh, right, I didn't think to say, we also have birds coming in and <laughs> harvesting those apples now. So yeah, it's, it's challenging to be a fruit grower. Um, a lot of people, that's the most, like they ask me, what can I do for the birds to keep them off my cherry trees? Netting is really the only thing that's consistently going to work. And it's hard when you have a really big, tall tree. So um, shade cloth is becoming more of an industry standard because we've gone to smaller trees that are more prone to sunburn on the fruit and everything. So they're now having to put shade cloth in on the trellises um, so that they can shade the trees. So um, with the uh, summers getting hotter, it's becoming more of an issue. This is our hog wire fencing, deer fencing. You can see it's the squares all the way down. So rabbits can easily walk through those squares. So we did this chicken wire all the way up to four feet tall. So we have it draped over on the bottom a little bit. 
underneath this gate, we found we had to put special, whoops, chicken wire down there to drag on the floor on the ground because um, they came in underneath. That's where they, even with the chicken wire on, they can get through little holes. Um, trellis types, if you're gonna do berries or grapes, it's different than um, trees. Um, and I'll show some pictures instead of talking about these a whole lot. You can do slender spindle, tall spindle, biaxis, multi-liter. And we also are doing the UFO or the upright fruiting offshoots training style. A lot of people in their yards, they do espalier. That's a highly intensified um, tie-on trellis system. Ours are not quite as tied on as espalier are. Kiwi support. Um, kiwi, they usually put uh, like the hog wire fencing up above and then the kiwi grows down through. So if you're doing kiwi, that would be kind of fun. Oh, I see a chat. Oh, handouts are on real roots. Thank you, Susan. <laughs> All right, just noticed that. <laughs> so this is, um, we did this cross bar here and there's a wire on each side. And that was more for our berries to try to keep those berries contained between those two wires. And, um, but we ended up planting half of our berry block in pairs. So I'm gonna try to do a multi-liter pair um, set up with those. Multi-liter because pears don't really have really good choices for dwarfing rootstock. So they still get pretty big. So by having multi-liters, I'm hoping to spread out that bigger um, to all four of those leaders. Um, this is a picture of the three different types of irrigation system that we have. And also, this is the nine wire trellis. This is vertical trellis. There's nine different, well, sorry, nine different wires. And um, then we have this intermediary water that we have a, this micro sprinkler on a stake in the ground coming off of that tube that's suspended on the wire. Or we have the overhead irrigation sprinklers up here. And those are from underground. There is an underground system. And then we have these drip wires that are here on the ground. So we have three different systems of irrigation, but this is the vertical trellis. This is the V trellis. So different orchards have done different degrees and they've gotten closer to more vertical than they, they used to be really wide and they'd almost touch the next row, but now they're getting more vertical. And we also did the UFO style. So we've planted these cherry trees at a 45 degree angle to the bottom. And we wanna train that cherry tree onto that bottom wire and then we'll let upright fruiting offshoots go up the wire. So vertical wire or the V trellis, we'll just let the upright fruiting offshoots go onto those wires. So it's just kind of a more for commercial growers, I think. That one's pretty intensive for putting all that stuff in. Over tree, the watering, Positive uses are for frost control, that frost problem in the springtime. If you wanna keep your blossoms alive, um, if the temperature goes to 29 degrees, you'll lose usually 10% of your bloom. So that's not bad, that's just thinning, right? If it goes down to 25, so 29, it's frozen, some of them die. 25, 90% of your blossoms will die. So if you put ice on the trees, it sounds like you're killing them. No, you're keeping the blossoms at 32, right? So you're saving them from dying. So frost control, if you have water, overhead water, you can use that for frost control. You can also use it now in the summer times, you could use it for evaporative cooling. You might want a different size sprinkler head on it. So put out different amount of water. And they also use it um, in pears for pear scylla. They put honeydew on the fruit and it's that sticky excrement that they put out. And you can use the overhead sprinklers to wash that off of the fruit. So that's kind of nice. 
potential problems, it keeps your orchard more moist. So you have more disease and insect problems potentially if you use over tree irrigation all year round. Under tree, it's kind of nice. Um, we used to have impact sprinklers under, but that can actually injure the trees because the impact sprinklers have a pretty high pressure. Um, but the micro sprinklers are actually pretty nice. It just, to and it keeps the moisture down lower. It doesn't wet the tree itself. Drip is probably your most efficient. So then your um, system water filtration is a must, unless you have city water or uh, well water out of your home well that you drink out of. If you have pond water or something like that, you definitely need filtration. Pressure regulation is also a must. You can blow up your drip irrigation. So um, I did already talk about the overhead irrigation. So these are the micro sprinklers up high. These are the micro sprinklers down low. These are the tree guards that I talked about earlier. So that's helping to keep the rodents off. I definitely want to keep this uh, herbicide strip underneath the trees. So we won't have this growth under the trees in the future, we'll just have bare ground. You can't see the drip lines that are in there, but we have those. That's mostly what we use is our drip lines. Here's a closer up. So this is the one that's on the wire up above that does the under tree irrigation, uh, the water transport. And these are the drip lines that are down one on each side of the roots. Um, and we wanna keep that uh, moist, especially in their first year. And then we back off a little bit and try to get the water, the roots to go down deeper. But proper planting technique, mitigate the entire area, not just the tree hole. A lot of people think that, you know, we can put all those good compost things into the tree hole. Well, not so much. In our Palouse soils, that hole that you've made acts like a pot. If you put a bunch of good compost in there specifically, so the better thing is to put compost over the entire area, till it in a bit, and then dig the hole, fill that hole back in with the stuff you dug out of it. You know, don't put special um, compost in there. What happens is those roots won't push into the clay. They'll just stay there and they can even circle the clay instead of pushing in and then your tree could tip over. So um, mitigate the entire area, put compost over the entire area. Um, two to four inches of organic matter like bark, sawdust, compost and work it into the entire area down four to six inches deep would be a good way to go. Type of plant ordered, you can have bare root, you can have ball and burlapped, um, you can have potted. Um, when you get especially bare root trees, do not let the roots of your purchase tree, purchase plants dry out, but do not leave them in standing water. So in standing water, one to two hours, but no more than six. And I got these, uh, all of this next information out of this planting landscape plants. Uh, Rita Hummel and Ray Malecki did this together and it's a very, very, very good publication. I have it listed on the bottom of this slide. So it's WSU publication EB1505, Planting Landscape Trees. So if you keep the trees in a cooler, keep it above freezing, but not with fruit, like I said earlier. Um, the, the ethylene gas given off by the fruit will kill the buds of the trees. In moist sawdust or bark in a cool shady place is a really good place. When we got our trees in, we weren't ready to plant them. It was too early. We got uh, some of our fruit bins, we put sawdust in them or, or bark and we wet that and kept it moist. Um, and that's where we stored our trees so the roots did not dry out. Um, you can heal them in temporarily to a planting depth in moist soil, but that's a little more work. It was easier to go into sawdust. So into these plastic bins, it works really good. These are actually potted plants in here, but you can imagine just if I had soil and bare root trees, the bare root trees don't have any leaves on them, so they wouldn't have leaves on them like this, but we were just trying to keep the roots moist. Proper planting technique, 
Again, going on, size of hole is larger than the root mass. So you don't want those roots to be crimped into a small hole. You want them to be able to spread out as wide as you can. Um, potted plants have the depth of the hole so that the soil line is about where the top of the soil, your top of your hole is at the regular soil level or even a little bit above that. Bare root, place grafts three to inches above, three to six inches above the ground. You don't want that graft union to go down into the soil because then it ruins the graft, the rootstock that you've chosen. It'll become a seedling tree. If you have that scion in the ground instead of above the ground, that graft union, your rootstock that you've carefully chosen will not, it'll be overridden by the scion putting out seedling roots. Um, I'll show some pictures of this. Cut out or spread out large roots um, that cross the center line of the plant. So sometimes the roots are all going in all directions when you get the plants. Try to spread them out, line them out so they're going to the, toward the outside edges of the hole. If you have potted plants and you have encircled roots, use a knife to actually vertically cut those roots. You're not gonna kill the tree, you're gonna help the tree. You don't want the tree to keep that round shape. You want those roots to spread out. They even say that you can slice up the bottom and split, spread the two halves out, you know, just to try to give those roots a chance to spread out. And I like to mound the bottom of the hole. Um, if you have a bare root tree so that you can set that at a height that you want and then run those roots down a little farther. So um, then you fill over the top and you firm the soil gently. You don't wanna stomp it in as hard as you can. You just firm it in, you know? So especially with our clay soil, right? You don't wanna stomp it in. Um, soak with water. I like that you laughed on that one because <laughs> that's, that's how I get my student employees' attention. No deaf stomps, okay? <laughs> so soak with water the same day as you plant it. So I like to soak that hole with water to let all that soil settle. You might be amazed at how much it settles down and then you might even need to put a little bit more soil into that hole. Um, at the very beginning, you could have kind of a dip around that tree or mound it up right at the tree and let it have a little a berm around the perimeter, especially if you're on a hillside, put a berm on that downhill. You want to get rid of that eventually, but uh, when you're first watering those baby roots in, it's, it's good to have a little bit of time that it can soak in a little deeper. Um, you don't want standing water at the trunk, but at the edge of the basin to hold the water at that level. Um, later, level out the soil to flat. So I'll show you a few pictures. This was my planted planting crew in COVID times. These uh, pots are the 15 gallon pots. And these poor trees had to stay there for a year because of complications with the new site. So they stayed in these for a year and we did not have encircling roots. The, the fabric pots are amazing. The roots just don't do that. They, they just stop, they just stop at the edges. So I was very pleased. And notice we have this graft union above the ground. So we're not gonna have seedling trees. We're gonna have that rootstock effect. This is a, our baby grafted trees that got wiped out by the rabbits the first year. So you can see they're so small, I didn't really wanna put tree guards on them, but I should have. So we kept our graft two to four inches above the ground because they might sink in a little more, but we did water these and they, they didn't sink in. So we did good. We kept the graft union above the ground. Um, yeah, water management. Be aware of the water holding capacity of your soil. You want friable soil, not just soaked soil. Um, you don't want dried out concrete soil, right? Our polluted soils do that. So monitor your soil moisture. And initially you wanna soak the planting hole to settle soil in around the roots. Um, never have long-term standing water in the planted area. I've had people just keep that really lower spot and keep it wet and you can actually kill your trees because the roots need both air and water to live. 
because they can drown too, or root rots can settle in if they're too wet too long. Um, with sandy or gravel soils, you'd have to water more frequently because then it just all washes out through the soil. Um, when you have more established trees, you want to water less times, like maybe one to three times per week, depending upon how big your trees are. When you have, uh, we have this water system for our drip irrigation. This is our filter. Um, this is, uh, we can have it go up through to do the fertigation. So this is the dositron. So we haven't really used this yet. We'll hopefully start using it this year. Um, and the filter, and that's important. Down in the ground here, we have the valve that turns on um, and off the system. Tree growth style and training, initial pruning. With the small grafted trees, um, you really don't have to prune them. They were really small. If you have a stick that they call them a whip um, in the past, or if you're having a freestanding tree, you could head it at the height that you want your branches to start. So then it would start growing branches at that point that you head it. Um, if you have a feathered tree, you've paid more money because the nursery took the time, the extra year to grow the side branches, you would wanna keep those branches as much as possible so that you don't set yourself back. So if you get a feathered tree or a branched tree, you probably don't need to prune it at all. If anything, prune off those crossing over roots. That would be the only thing you would prune before you planted it. The training style, um, you could do freestanding central leader. There's a lot of info on the internet about that. Spanish bush is more keeping it a bush type tree. And um, the cherries, that's something that some people have done with those. Um, I've not tried an apple with it, but you could probably Think about that. You could read up on it. Support uh, post or posts for individual trees. So you can put a post right next to the tree. You would want to put it on the leeward side. No, you would want to put on the toward the wind. The, the tree would not blow into the post. The tree would mostly blow away from the post. So you tie the tree to the post. So we put our trees on the west side because in the summertime, the wind is mostly out of the southwest. So they blow, sorry, we put them on the east side of the tree. So it blows away, so we need to tie back to the wire. So you don't want the trees to blow onto the wire because um, it rubs on the wire and it can cause wounds. Um, vertical trellis, I showed pictures, V trellis. Um, I showed that espalier, I don't have any pictures of that, but. Um, that's a really highly tied on system. So this is our apple training and pruning block in randomized complete block design. This is our production block. We're gonna have Johnna Gold, uh, Fuji's, Cosmic Crisp, Golden Delicious, Max Spur, and Gala in this block, Johnna Gold's. So that'll be the, where we get most of our fruit for our fruit sale. Rodent control, this is so, so important. Um, I've already said that, but fencing and tree guards, physical deterrents are really good. Short and frequent mowing, encourage predators. You can put up bird perches, owl boxes, kestrel nesting boxes, um, and discourage fruit damaging birds. I don't know if you have like a dog that you wanna have running around your trees and chasing birds away, that might work. Um, Approved bait underground with caution. Again, if you have pets or children, you don't want them to get into the bait. Um, approved bait in bait stations. I made a two inch diameter PVC T-shaped bait stations. Those are pretty economical to make. And you can make those as long as you want to so that your kids or dogs can't get in there. And um, the rodents really love to run through them and they'll pick up that bait and um, eat it. Um, some traps are allowed in some places in Washington state. They're a little bit funny about trapping snap traps. Um, uh, they definitely don't want you trapping for fur, but you know, for mice, I think we're allowed to do that. We're not trapping those for fur in Washington state, but in Idaho, I don't think there's any regulation on that stuff, but 
check your state, whichever place you live, to make sure that you're um, allowed to use traps if you want to do that. The tree guards, like I said, that was our best deterrent. We've got tree guards on everything now, just in case. <laughs> so in the winter time, if the snow gets up to the tree guard level, though, then the meadow voles might have a chance to eat that. Or if the rabbits were in, the rabbits could eat from there up. So, um, you know, even with the tree guards and the snow gets deep, you can still have some rodent damage. These are poc uh, go pocket gopher mounds. So they're the ones that you don't really see trails on the surface, but you see a lot of piles of freshly dug soil, right? So those are pocket gophers. And then this is meadow voles. So they love to hide under things. They love, they're the ones that graze the grass and leave the trails. So those are meadow voles. Um, and they will actually use old pocket gopher holes as well. So the pocket gophers create the freeways and then the meadow voles move in. <clears throat> And this is what we do here. We give class tours and tours to people. And this is our looking down toward our apple variety block. No, this is looking down toward our stone fruit block that we just got planted this year. Um, so in the future, we hope to have fruit sales all the way from berries coming ripe in July through the end of the season the end of October, and then we keep, have our fruit storage, so then we put everything in the storage. So the students are here learning about growing fruit, and um, I hope to have public um, tours too in the future. So that'll be kind of fun. I hope to have you picks in the future. We'll see how all that goes. This is when we had our fruit sales in the COVID times. We had it all set up. We had to bag up everything for everyone and the people stood out here under the shaded area that we set up. Um, so, but now during non-COVID times, you can actually come in and pick fruit out of the bins. So that is how we are currently doing our fruit sales. And this is how you can find out about our fruit sales. Come and support our operations by shopping at our WSU Horticulture Center fruit sales. I think I finished kind of on time. <laughs> <laughs>